Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, being with us today. Uh, my name is Sandra Shenge, and I will be your moderator for this open dialogue. Um, so to all, to everyone, all protocol observed, I'd like to wish you a warm welcome to the August 2021 open dialogue. And today's um, dialogue is going to be themed quality education in Rwanda, and um, it will contribute to uh, the ongoing education policy review in Rwanda. Uh, so thank you so much. And without more delaying, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Eric Ndushabandi for his introduction remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I'm always honored and very pleased to see this uh, space open with a very, very, very important audience. Thank you, uh, FES, our partner. It is very lovely to work with you all these years. So I thank uh, very much uh, the Minister of Education with the all protocol observed. Bavandini, we are talking about a very important topic. The policy of education is under review. I'm not sure that I know the former one. I'm not sure that I know where we are going really, but this is an open space for us. And I thank Minister of Education to grant uh, to academia and civil society organization and all people around this table today to value our contribution. IRDP wants really to bring input, but from very critical and balanced perspective and very informed. So this is why we started by understanding what are the systems, what kind of administration of education do we have and we intend to have in the future. So let me thank very much uh, our specialists who will really open our mind and the critical analysis to embrace the draft presentation of the policy from um, Deji Rose, then we can contribute very substantially. Thank you very much and uh, have a good uh, discussion. Mrs. Uh, Baguma, I would like to invite you to take the floor and give us your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank you very much, uh, the Institute and the FES for for this very important uh, occasion to us. So, so we have four bigger uh, policy focus areas that I would want us uh, maybe to know. So number one is on Rwandan cultural values. So we are also, we always talk about education. And when we talk about education, people think of just teaching, just academics and everything that is happening in class. But we found out that it's very important also to look at the values, the cultural values that will also build uh, these kids' future as we are teaching them, of course, sciences and mathematics and all those other things. But uh, an element of values, what we call Inda Angagachiro in Rwanda, is very important and we want to inculcate this into the education system. The issue around no one should be left behind in education system, whether learners with disabilities, whether issues around gender, talking about girls mostly. Uh, and for example, those who are, coming, who are coming from poor families and they can't even afford to buy a pen or a, a notebook or a, a book or anything that they need at school. So uh, that is uh, those two. The third one is teachers first. So this policy comes to address in a poly, at policy level, uh, looking around teacher motivation, uh, teachers' well-being, but also the capacity. So capacity of teachers is very important, as well as their motivation, uh, so that they can be able to deliver, go be able to teach, and make sure our children are learning. And the fourth focus area is around the right skills. So right skills and competences that are needed in the labor market. So mostly we are talking about the current needs, but now we are trying to look at uh, far beyond today. So looking at the future market uh, uh, needs, future skills that are needed. Uh, so we ask ourselves today, in five years, 10 years, 20 years, what is it that uh, uh, would be needed so that we can prepare uh, the kids when uh, it is still early. So I'll go straight to the 10 objectives that would 
uh, I think, give us the general picture. The objective number one is around the Rwandan values. So we really want to make sure that we focus uh, on Rwandan values with high level mastery of strong learning foundation. Number two is uh, issues around uh, pre-primary, we still have issues in access uh, where uh, we have only 24% of kids who are supposed to be in pre-primary, they're in that level. So others are outside there, but also making sure that kids start uh, start primary at the right age because most of them uh, start very late and this affects the whole system. So we want to make sure that they start at the right age, they complete the, the, the pre-primary, the school readiness program on time, they start primary on time, but also finish the whole cycle. Objective number three is around health and safety issues because this is also very important to, uh, to our schools. So when you look at the previous uh, policy, we were talking mostly about HIV, AIDS, and other sexually transmitted diseases to kids and malaria and all those sorts of things. But now we are going beyond to see uh, how do we make sure that we deal with issues of school feeding, sanitation, environment, you see environmental protection of school, and foreseen situations like long illnesses of kids, natural hazards, the pandemics. Number four is on the learning outcomes themselves. So access, going to school is one thing, but what the kids are getting is another thing. So when you, even you look at the human capital index, we have the years of schooling, but the years adjusted to them, to, 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 to them, and that's what they are learning. So we're focusing much more on learning outcomes and making sure that we implement the competence-based curriculum effectively but also looking at how do we conduct our assessments. So comprehensive assessments, very important, also, but also focusing on English as a medium of instruction, because this is very important. It's a tool that teachers use. It's a language that they use to teach. Objective number five uh, is on equity, uh, issues around gender-related challenges to ensure that all uh, barriers are removed to any group of people that those barriers that might uh, prevent them from learning, from going to school, from learning, just like others. So handling issues uh, uh, depending on the, on the situation. Number six is on STEM. How do we make sure that we, 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 we have effective and modern mechanism of teaching and learning in STEM? How do we make sure that we have more access and especially we saw that we still have uh, fewer females in STEM. We don't have enough uh, equipment like labs, like uh, even the teachers themselves uh, who are teaching science subjects. So what efforts, what mechanisms, what initiatives can be put in place to make sure that we enhance STEM from early ages? Because now we are talking from pre-primary and it is possible. TVET and higher learning institutions. So I talked about in the four pillars, in the four focus areas, I talked about the, few, the current and the future skills. Now this we are relating to our TVET and higher learning institutions. So how do we make sure that uh, the right skills, so right match of graduates and labor market skills and competencies. And our eighth objective is on reformed pre-service teacher training. So I talked about teachers first uh, in this policy, but you go back looking at, okay, apart from their motivation, their well-being, uh, what about their capacity? How do we prepare our teachers? Are we, do they have the skills, the knowledge and the competences that are needed to go to school to teach uh, these kids? So teacher training, the pre-service itself in our TTCs, in the College of Education, but also looking at continuous professional development to those teachers who are, who are already in service and uh, their career path itself. Um, another thing, last but one, is on partnerships. So um, we have so many partners. We have development partners, we have private sector, we have faith-based organizations, we have churches, uh, we talked about those, civil society. They are they're here, they're working with us. We are, not, we are not alone in the sector, but how do we reinforce the partnership? 
how do we coordinate as the Ministry of Education? You know, at policy level, we are there. We have at implementation level, we have our institutions, we have REB, we have RTB, we have NESA, we have UR, we have RP, we have districts because our education system is decentralized. So district sectors, that's why we have education staff at those levels. But how do we make sure that we orient these partners to where we really need them? The last objective is um, on uh, management itself of the education system. So effective and efficient education system and institutional leadership and management of education. So here we might think of uh, credible planning is very, very important also at policy level, monitoring and evaluation, but also making sure that we have that coordination. So we're talking about how do we, uh, even resources and education financing itself falls under this objective. So when you look at how, how do we finance our education system, I had someone mentioning about it. We, we depend mostly from the national treasury, from the national budget, but how do we involve these partners? How do we make sure that higher learning institutions, universities, the TVETs can also contribute through their income generating activities that can also support uh, the education system in as far as um, uh, funding is concerned. So we are in consultation. The objective of this dialogue to us is getting views getting comments, what do people think should be improved in the education system? Because this policy, when it's approved, it will be implemented and it will affect everyone, not just students, teachers, parents, the whole system. So what we needed is to get, what is it that you think it's very important that we shouldn't ignore? What is it that you think Ministry of Education should uh, emphasize much and put much more uh, efforts through improving the quality of education. I'll now invite Professor Masenge Shoka Musinzi to take the floor. I have tried to, to check existing policies and I have identified at least three dominant ones. Number one, it is the promotion of knowledge-based economy, knowledge-based society. The number two, which may be a bit in contradiction, if, if I talk on the perspective of academia, no child is left behind philosophy. The students attending this school have very different levels. So this diversification of, uh, of, of curriculum, diversification of motivation, or diversification of motivation of teacher, asks us now bring the question, which standards of quality can we just assess when we are talking about our educational system? This requires to go beyond the administrative inspection, where you come and check the, 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 the content, you check the, the scheme of work, you check the preparation of lesson, and you need to check with them how do they put in practice acquired competencies. I think you have some element we can draw from our tradition as far as the motivation of teacher and motivation of learner is concerned. So uh, let's now move to Mr. Fred Mujisha, Senior Research Fellow at IRDP for your presentation on education stakeholders and financing for quality education. Thank you. In terms of uh, the quality of education, what do we mean by quality of education? Because before you finance something, before you understand the stakeholders to something, then you should know what that thing is. Now, when you look at the financing aspect, uh, financing the quality of education is actually far from uh, being guaranteed across the world. It is not only in Rwanda. Uh, you find that there, are, and that's an observation that has been made by UNESCO itself. You find that uh, there is a, a benchmark, an international benchmark. If you want to have good education, you should uh, provide uh, adequate financial resources to this. For between four to six percent of your GDP uh, to, towards education, or between fifteen to uh, to twenty percent of your public expenditure, what you have as your annual uh, uh, fine uh, budget for the at the national level, at least between fifteen to twenty percent of it 
should be should go to the education sector you find out today that most, uh, th there are quite a number of countries all over the world uh, we have at least 33 percent of countries which fall below that level they have they they, they spend or they provide a budget which is too low in comparison to international uh, benchmarks. I have two concepts to throw out there to the Minister of Education and to all of us for reflection as we think of this uh, uh, new policy in education. The first concept is decolonization of education which goes hand in hand what we, what we call also epistemic injustices. I was happy to hear that the, 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 the Desh, uh, when, was, when she was presenting among the, the objectives of, uh, of this policy is to emphasize on Rwandan values. I would say emphasize also on Rwandan epistemologies, Rwandan knowledges, what we, are, what we call roughly as indigenous knowledges and practices. I think it's something we can think about. How can our education cater for our, our knowledge, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge and practices? The concept I want to throw for your consideration, for our consideration, is what we are calling today in the educational debate, the fourth industrial revolution. What is it and how can we cater for it in our education? The fourth industrial revolution here, I'm considering it as a fusion of technologies, you know, various technologies coming up and the interaction, the fusion and the interaction of, of these technologies. That fusion is leading to a kind of collision in a such a way that the physical, the digital and the biological domains are actually disappearing. I was happy to hear about STEM, but how can STEM cater for the fourth industrial revolution? And how can we harmonize our education in such a way that we are prepared for the consequences, benefits, challenges of this industrial, fourth industrial revolution? So let's invite Ambassador Gasamajera for your inputs. 15 years ago, I was privileged to share a contribution with IRDP uh, there was a survey that uh, had been conducted um, and some of the recommendations hinted on a point on the education policy uh, whereby we discussed what we called by then in French, education, adéquation, education, emploi. This terminology has been in the air for quite some time. Uh, we have gone a long way ever since. Something has been done, I know. But I still hold on the same interrogation. What was really done towards matching the quality of education with the requirements of the market and indeed the needs of the learners themselves, of the graduates at some stage? Um, secondly, in the education policy, has it there been any room left for continued education, for innovation, for research and development, right from not only on the higher level, on uh, in the tertiary education, or in the postgraduates, or uh, even at the uh, place of work? I know this exists there, but right from the lower levels of education. Dr. Theogene, Vice Chancellor at the AUCA to, um, to share with us any inputs you would have. My idea is, uh, is that we have to harmonize uh, what we are giving as uh, academic institutions in terms of the content and what is needed at the market. How this will be done? There is an initiative which has started, but is uh, for some uh, for some areas like uh, students who are specializing in medicine. They cannot only graduate and immediately go to the field to the hospitals to start working. They have also to graduate from uh, uh, from a medical council. This is a practice that all the the areas should adopt. 
if you have to, to, to graduate from law, let us have Institute of Law, which is going to produce qualified staff who uh, qualified uh, employees who would be needed by different uh, courts. That what I'm saying is uh, we have to emphasize on professionalism. Another element is uh, the quality of researchers that are coming from Rwanda. They are very poor. We need not only to graduate people in quantity, but also in quality. So all of our universities in Rwanda, we should include this culture of having values, not only to graduate the people without humanity. I am uh, Dr. Simeon Wheeler. I taught for many years in University of Rwanda, um, independent consulting at the moment. The, uh, the issue that we face in university education in Rwanda, it really connects to the, the quality of the intake of the students who come in. Um, a large section of, a large part of this is the lower, lower levels of education, primary, secondary education. The teaching of language at university level is not conversational English so much as the, the usefulness of, of English as an academic uh, medium for discussing research or for discussing um, the, the kind of topics that a student will be learning. So that is one, one area. I think that could be done between the uh, completion of A-levels and the, the uh, admission into university with, with an intensive, immersive kind of, of course that would prepare a university student for the actual engagement in, in the, the thinking, the quality thinking that we need to see in, in Rwandan university students. The second point I wanted to raise for, for thinking, especially from the Ministry of Education, is the output, the exit, exit degrees. I think it would be much wiser for the university to consider a policy for exit degrees that, is, that offers ordinary degrees for the majority of students and simply selects the very best students or self those students can self-select themselves. To, uh, to do the extra work that is in, involved in graduating with honors. I heard much of practicalities and so forth, but what is our idea of education? That's something that needs to be clear. Number two, what is the kind of student do we want to train? What do we want to train him for? Because these are the questions that determine the policy. Without clearing those issues, we would always have very practical thing and then uh, we do not really get where we want to go. Uh, for example, in the Jesuit schools, uh, there is a clear idea of the person you want to train. It is a very holistic kind of training, which really tackles every single aspect of the individual. So whether it is uh, his personality, his values, his attitudes, his competence, everything is included. And so uh, I see, for example, there's a gap in our system uh, because uh, people have been very critical of the old system and have gone to the extreme in the criticism. Uh, now there is a song that, you know, training is all about science and technology and humanities are not considered to, as, as important. But this world is run by ideas and ideas come from, uh, from humanities. And there are also uh, an opinion that those who do humanities have no uh, job on the market, which is not true. As we stand as a new uh, nation in New Rwanda, we need good lawyers, we need good diplomats, we need good uh, you know, poets, we, go, we need good journalists, we need all these you know, other aspects. And uh, there is a whole, whole range of uh, opportunities that is linked to that that is being neglected. And so uh, uh, at the level of uh, the, 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 the system of education, we need also conceptors of systems, not simply people who implement uh, whatever you know, uh, proposal that comes from abroad or whatever we borrow from others. So what we need is to inform and to train our students that just we are opening their mind to the world.
and they are the one who are going to construct their own competences. And I think competence-based curriculum is also backed by this philosophy. Uh, Rose, if you could take back the, um, the floor and engage with uh, the, the different inputs we've been receiving. Um, uh, Dr. Silvestro talked about the fourth industrial revolution, which is, which is very, very important. And uh, we all acknowledge that, but he also insisted on its benefits. So we shouldn't be looking at only the benefits we agree, but also looking at the challenges that it comes uh, with. It's not just him, there's someone else who mentioned the same thing in the chat. He mentioned that it's a challenge, that people are not used to, to this kind of learning, so we should be very careful. We are mindful of that. Uh, we're also working with the Ministry of ICT. You know, They developed uh, the issues around cyber uh, security and kids protection, child protection online. So these are the things that we're still working in. We still have challenges for sure, but uh, together with other partners, we see how do we benefit. Entry requirements, but also exit requirement is, is very, very important, but making sure that it's not just access. Someone may put it very well, we said, education for all, can it be work for all? Can it work to all? It's true, we have very good policies, but as you said, what went wrong is something that people should go back and see. As I said, we had this policy and we're looking at all the things that we said we are going to implement up, up to 2020, that vision 2020, what are the issues? So there are issues that we analyzed. We also have the education sector strategic plan that we are about to review, mid-term review anyway, because it's up, up to 2024, because this one now lays, we have the targets and all the activities, at least to see what is it that we are doing at the second, third year before we finish the ESSP. So we should, uh, I agree, we should put much emphasis and efforts to make sure that the policies that we are developing are implemented. So thank you again to everyone. And I would like now to give back the floor to, to Eric, to Dr. Eric Nushavandi for the conclusive remarks. And thanks a lot for, for the vivid and lively discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Impressive, impressive audience and uh, good insight. Thank you, Deji Rose, for your willingness. And this has been very constructive. I was impressed by the contribution of my students and, and the young people, by the vice chancellors and the professors from the university. I thank you very much. And we look forward really to having you. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you in the, our next math dialogue spaces. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Eric. Uh, thank you, everyone. Special thank you to the speakers. Uh, thank you, Dej Rose, for sharing the, the policy review did so well in terms of uh, highlighting some of uh, uh, the key objectives of, of the policy and how different it could be from the previous one. Uh, special thank you to uh, uh, Professor Masenje Sho, uh, Mr. Fred, thank you so much, and uh, Dr. Silvestre, thank you. Sandra, as always, for such an amazing moderation. I just wanted to say massive, massive thank you to all of you and very much looking forward to, to the final policy review of our education system. Uh, have uh, a good uh, rest of the day.